I have, has been for years. Um, you have your Bibles, open them up to the book of Titus. I want to thank you. I've gotten a lot of um, text messages over the weekend this past week, and uh, uh, I do appreciate that so much. Um, went home to see my mom and dad last weekend, and uh, for those that weren't here, my mom was diagnosed a week ago Wednesday with pancreatic cancer and is not doing very well at all. And um, I, I tell you, you know, I, I like to text people. It's, it's convenient, but I, sometimes I felt like someone said to me today, sometimes I feel when I text it's kind of empty. But it's amazing when you allow the Holy Spirit to prompt you and you respond, um, those texts that y'all have sent me over the past week have always come at the right time and have always been a tremendous source of encouragement. And I thought, wow, I had no idea that text could be so encouraging. And so I do want to thank you. For those that weren't here Wednesday night, I will tell you a funny story from last weekend. Uh, me, my, all my sons, my sister and her family were all there at my mom's house. She said, just one more time, I want to be with everybody. My dad's struggling with Alzheimer's. And uh, my oldest son, Chad, him and his wife brought their, their little dog with them. Uh, Lily is her name. And uh, Chad gave my dad a dog treat and said, hey, give this to Lily. She'll be your friend for life. And so Lily came over and she's standing there, you know, just she's like a terrier mix. So she's nervous wanting that dog treat. And my dad looked at her and said, no, no, no. <laughs> and he put it in his own mouth. And it wasn't but a second. He made an awful face. Like, what is that? That's a dog treat. And he just kept it in his mouth. I, I don't know if he was chewing it or what. He said, well, spit it out, Dad. And... Uh, then he went to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and he realized they had just run out of bread, and so he was looking everywhere for bread, and uh, he grabbed a box of cereal. And I said, uh, Dad, what are you doing? And he said, I'm going to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich. I said, you going to spread it on that cereal? He said, yeah, that'll be fine. That'll be fine. I know this is mean, but I just stepped back. I was going to watch. And Mom came to the rescue and said, let's just fix him a bowl of cereal. And I'm like, Mom, you just ruined it. I was wanting to see him spread peanut butter and jelly on those little Cheerios, you know. But Titus chapter 3, Titus 3, if you would continue to pray for my, if, if, if you think about her, uh, her pain is a big thing. She's in a whole lot of pain. And then if you could remember my sister, a whole lot of responsibility since she's living right there has fallen in her lap and on her shoulders. And uh, if my mom passes away soon, then dad is not in a condition where he can stay by himself and She'll probably have to quit her job and keep him at home. And uh, if any of you have ever dealt with stuff like that, you know that can be a weighty responsibility. And so we do value your prayers. Titus chapter 3. If you love Jesus, say amen. 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 Well, that's good to hear. I, I, I was starting to wonder if y'all did. Uh, Titus 3. Let's all stand, please. We're just going to read two verses. So this will be, you won't stand long, okay? I'll read the first one. You read the second one with me. Read them responsibly. Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Father, thank you for loving us. Now, Lord, thank you for your word. Would you give us hearts and minds that are yielded to your desires, your will, uh, that we might allow you to work in us and to grow in us, that we might be more effective disciples of yours. In Christ's name, amen. You can be seated. You've been going through the book of Titus the past uh, few weeks, four weeks or so. Remember Paul left Titus on the island of Crete, and he said in the first chapter there, he said, Titus, I'm leaving you there to set things in order. Now the Cretans were known as a lazy, dishonest people. To be called a Cretan or a Cretan in those days was considered a, a, a slam. It was a, a, a demeaning thing. That was just their reputation, their national reputation. Hey, that's a bunch of liars, cheaters, stealers, and they're lazy. And so these Cretans have now accepted Christ as their Savior, but they're still living like they were. And, and they're not, in other words, their walk is not matching what they say they believe in any way. No change at all. And Paul said, now look, I, I want, here's what you need to do. Set things in order. 
get things straightened out here. Help them to know exactly what this thing of being a Christian is all about. Uh, uh, find some people that can be pastors there. Train them to be pastors. <clears throat> and then he says in, in chapter 2, he said, here's the things I want you to teach them. And he gives four people groups here. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to teach the older men these things. That here's what living out the Christian faith means as an older man. And then tell the younger men these things. And tell the older ladies these things. And tell the younger ladies these things. And those that are slaves or servants, teach them these things right here. How to live out our faith. Very practical. <clears throat> and then he goes on to say, uh, uh, we talked about two weeks ago, I think. It says, uh, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us. And he said, now here's what the grace of God teaches us right here. You see, there were two schools of thought coming in as false teachers. There was one school of thought that came in saying, hey, look, yeah, you're saved by grace plus works. It's the grace of God, his unmerited favor, but in order to get to heaven, you still have to do these things. Uh, Brother Miller was telling us in Sunday school this morning that uh, when he was a younger man, how old were you when you was washing your car on Sunday? About 21 years old, washing his car on Sunday. His family had a rule you couldn't uh, play cards on Sunday or do different things on Sunday. And so he's washing his car and his dad said, oh, you're going to hell because you're washing your car on Sunday. Okay, now listen, when you wash your car, has nothing to do with going to heaven or hell, okay? It is only by faith in Christ and the grace of God, that unmerited favor, that we can go to heaven, right? But there were these coming in saying, no, no, no yeah, faith is good, but you also need to, to be circumcised according to the law of Moses, and you need to keep these certain holy days, and these things you can't eat, and these things you can't eat. Boy, I'm glad we're not under that. And, uh, but here's these things you've got to do if you want to go to heaven. There was another extreme that came in saying, no, 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 look. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. They're saying, look, it's nothing to do with works. So what that means, you get saved, then you can live any way you want because you're on your way to heaven. Titus was to teach him, listen, that, that's not what grace means. Because God loved me when I was undeserving, because he favored me when there was nothing in it to merit that, uh, nothing in me to merit that favor. Here's what God's grace teaches us it teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly, righteously, and godly right now in this present world. Right now. That's what God's grace teaches us. In Romans chapter 6. Uh, uh, Paul says as he's writing the book to the Romans and he says what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound he was saying listen there is God's grace is, is uh, without measure there's always enough grace to meet every need so in light of that but because of that should we just keep on sinning and, and just do run around just mindlessly sinning because there's more grace and then he said this no God forbid Grace teaches the opposite of that. Grace teaches I don't have to do works to get to heaven, but in order to show my love for God, I do want to live in such a way that I know this is what God is like. This is what Christ was like. In verse number 1 and 2 of Titus 3, where we're at now, these two verses deal with what we need to do. The rest of the verses after this, which we'll cover next week, deal with why we need to do them. Now, I want you to think for just a moment. What would it take for people to think well of Christians? Now, I know that's kind of a loaded question because no matter what you do, there are some, the skeptics, unbelievers, that no matter what you do, they're going to think ill of Christ and Christianity because Christ holds them accountable. And I understand that. 
But some people have legitimate arguments. I think it was Gandhi, once again, that said, uh, listen, I have no problem with your Christ. It's your Christian to have a problem with because they're so unlike the Christ I read about in your Bible. And some have legitimate arguments to that, to that end. That, you know, these, these people, the only people I've seen in my life, maybe they would say, are, are Christians that they say this, and, and, and on Sunday they, they're like this, but the rest of the week, their life isn't matching what their Christ is that they talk about. I wonder what it would take for people to think well of Christians. Here's some things we see in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3. Look here, number 1, he says, put them in mind. He said, now here's something I want you to keep before them. Put them in mind of these things. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates. And stop right there. To be submissive to authority. Principalities and powers, those are governmental authorities. You know, listen, folks, when we disobey the law as Christians, we discredit our gospel. Sometimes we act like, well, hey, I'm a Christian. I'm above the law. I got pulled over out here a little over a year ago. I ran this stop sign out here. That officer, and we've become great friends, it's not the only time he's pulled me over, and we meet each other often. And uh, so I, I, I ran to stop. What, I was just talking to somebody, and you know, I, I, I just it's kind of what do they call a rolling stop, which means you didn't stop. And I just wasn't paying attention. I I, I knew no cars were coming, so I just kind of rolled on through. And I see, and I see these blue lights. I'm like, what in the world's this all about? Well, sir, you didn't uh, stop at the stop sign. I'm like, Are you sure? I I thought for sure I stopped. Not sorry you didn't. So he writes me a ticket. So okay. You're not going to heaven. No, I didn't tell him that. <laughs> I didn't tell him that. It wasn't long after that, I crossed the bridge and my son Trent here is pulled over. I thought, man alive, down there near the Yummy Orient. So I pulled around in front of Trent to see if he needs any help. And I just get out of my car and I'm standing there and I hear the officer's voice. Pastor Wise, can you come back here? And I was like, oh, no. So I walked back there, and he said, this is your son, isn't it? I said, yeah. He said, he ran that same stop sign. I said, okay. He said, but when I pulled up his tag, uh, tag, I saw that last name Wise, and I thought, I bet that's that preacher's son. I can't do this to them again. He said, I'm letting him off with a warning. I said, okay, well, thank you. I appreciate that. But if he ran it, you know, he deserves a ticket. And uh, just throw it to him. No, I didn't tell him that. Some months later, I'm over in southern, the southern end of Mount Olive. And I'm rolling to a stop sign there at County Line Road where uh, Church Street uh, runs into County Line. I'm coming to that stop sign, and I see him. And I'm a very friendly guy. I see him and another officer I know. And so I start waving at him. And I look both ways as I'm still rolling, and I wave at him and just run on through that stop sign, and I wave at him as he passes. He turns around and hits the blue lights. I said, I did it again. I pull over there in the projects right where I was going to visit kids that I bring to church. He pulls up behind me. He comes up grinning. I said, I did it again, didn't I? He said, yes, sir, you did, Pastor, but that's not why I pulled you over. I said, well, hey, I deserved a ticket. You know, hey, I deserved a ticket. I ran the stop sign. I saw you. I saw you. I was waving at you. He said, I know. I was waving back. And uh, he said, I just pulled over because it just felt so fun to do it. <laughs> Here, you go on your way. Now, listen, sometimes somebody will pull us over or whatever, we get caught for doing something we shouldn't. And, and, and I've heard this card played before. Well, I'm a preacher. Well, that doesn't make it any less of an infraction of the law. Well, I'm a, I was just going to church. I was, listen, the reason I was going 105 in this 35 is I was about to be late for church, and that would be a sin, and I want to be on time. 
not telling him you're never on time. Okay? Now listen, when we disobey the law, we discredit our gospel. We should obey, listen to this, we as Christians should submit to the laws of this land up to the point of where the law would have us disobey our God. And that's where we have to draw a line. Listen to Acts 5, 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. They were in prison for preaching the gospel. The angel of the Lord came and got them out of there, and they went right back to the temple. They're preaching about Jesus Christ. The, the rulers get them and bring them in and say, hey, we, we told you not to preach or teach anymore in his name, and you're filling the whole city with his name. And they said, hey, we ought to obey God rather than man. We're supposed to preach his word, and we're just going to keep doing it. If you want to throw us back in jail, that's fine. If you want to stone us to death and beat us with thrives, whatever you want to do, but we're going to keep preaching Christ. <clears throat> but we should be obedient to the laws of the land up to the point where the laws of the land have us to disobey uh, the word of God. You understand that so far? Okay, that's pretty simple, right? You don't like it, though, do you? No, but we ought to obey the law. Okay, now listen to the next part. Let's go on. To be ready to every good work. Ready. It, it has this idea right here. You're on the, on the edge of your seat here. Man, you know, you, when you're at home and supper's being cooked, and you're thinking, oh, any minute she's going to say it's ready. When all five of my sons lived at home and my wife said, hey, food's ready. You best just sit there for a second and let the stampede get, get past. I think it was Lance would, from time to time, would just about knock someone over. All right. It gives this idea of being on the edge of the seat. Followers of Christ ought to always be looking for opportunities to do good. It, it ought to be like this where at work, okay, I'm, I'm looking for an opportunity. Who can I help with something? What can I do? I, man, I, I want to show the love of Christ. I want to be a hard worker. What, what something good I can do rather than sitting back and saying, boy, let somebody else do that. Well, we need something done at the church. Hey, anytime you need some, something done at the church, call someone else. Okay. Oh, the followers of Christ we ought to be sitting on the edge of our seats looking for opportunities. It carries the idea here where it says uh, um, uh, be ready to every good work. It gives the idea or carries the idea of serving your community. Listen to Acts chapter 10 verse 37 and 38. The word I say, that word I say you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing what? He went about doing good. And healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So here's what Christ did, what Luke is telling us here in Acts. He said he, he, he went about just doing good. He was looking for opportunities. Man, here's somebody that's hungry. Let's... Let's feed them, guys. Hey, here's somebody that's sick. Okay, you're healed. Hey, here's somebody who's, whose loved one just died. Okay, arise. Uh, here's somebody that's blind. Okay, here, uh, open your eyes. You can see. Here's someone that's deaf, and he gave them their hearing. He went about doing good. There's one portion of the scripture that says that everything he did, if everything he did that was good was written down in a book, the world could not contain the volumes of books that would have to be written. Went about doing good. That's the idea that it carries for a child of God. Not just sitting back waiting for an opportunity to come, but actively looking for those opportunities. Here's something I, I can do to help somebody. Think about what Jesus did. He fed the hungry. He healed the sick. He taught truth. He gave drink to the thirsty. He listened to people. He showed compassion. I looked through the Bible, and maybe it's there. I just don't remember it, and I couldn't find it. I've not been able to find where he went around inviting people to come to the synagogue. 
I don't read it. And it seems like if that would have been an active part of his life, it would have recorded that, that he was like, hey, my name's Jesus, I'm the Messiah. Would you come to synagogue on Saturday? I want to see you on the Sabbath, all right? Until then, won't be thinking about you. We don't see that. That's not to say that it would have been a bad thing or that he didn't do it, but if he did do it, it seems like it would have been important enough to record. Here's what he did. He actively entered their world. He actively entered into their needs. He actively entered into their pain. He actively entered into their struggles. He actively entered into their fears. Are you following me? That's what it means there, that we're to be ready unto every good work. When that good work comes along, that opportunity, sitting on the edge of our seats, okay, well, what can we do? What if we did this? What if that's how we lived our life, for real? What if church, the churches and communities corporately did this? What if every believer faithfully gave to the church, and what if that church used those funds responsibly for not only running the church but for doing for others? Listen, I strongly believe this, that if God's people were faithfully doing what Christ did, the government would not have to get so involved in social issues and social needs because God's people would be able to have it covered. I believe that. Ready to every good work. Well, we're ready to invite people to things, but Christ, he went beyond that. He said, okay, let me, he went to the lepers, those ten lepers, you know what he did? He did what nobody else would do. He touched them. That was almost a death sentence to someone. He cared enough to touch them. Steve was telling me about a, Steve Kennedy was telling me about a, a story about a pastor who was preaching a revival or something. And I may not get the particulars of this story right, so you can ask Steve and he can smooth it out for me. But something to the effect that there were several, several men several men several men came to a revival meeting just kind of to be mockers I guess they're homosexual men came and sat down front it was obvious they were not there for good reasons and after the service the preacher came down and he hugged those men and said hey thanks for coming we were glad to have you here he did what many would say that's unthinkable the next night, one of those men came back, and he said, after the service, he said, listen, you're the first man to ever hug me that didn't want something. I want to know what that's all about. And he got to share Christ with that man, and a simple act of love, genuine love, a simple act of entering into that person's, not into their sin, but entering into their struggle and their pain, and just simple... Hey, we were honored to have you here. And that man saw Christ in that simple deed, and the next night he came back and trusted Christ as his Savior. You see, it wasn't an invitation to church or to whatever that, that got him saved. He came to cause trouble. But somebody caring enough to be ready unto every good work, and that man trusted Christ. What if we did that, church? What if we did that? I had someone sit down with me this week. And nobody that's never been to church here, but they confided in me about something in their lifestyle. And I'm sure they were waiting for some kind of backlash, but that's not what they got. I tried my best to show them the love of Christ and to give them some hope and give them the gospel. I'm building a relationship with that person. Hopefully, I'll be able to see him come to Christ. I want you to look at verse number two. To speak evil of no man. Oh, boy. 
Oh, man, speak evil of no man. Man, that wipes out 80% of our jokes, doesn't it? Ephesians 4.29 says this, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Now, that word no, this, the New Testament was written in Greek, and I, I love to go deep in the Greek sometimes. That word no means no. None. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but here, you're a follower of Christ, so here's what's supposed to come out of your mouth. That which is good to the use of edifying, that word edifying means to build up, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Hey, finish this with me. You probably heard your parents say as you were growing up, if you can't say something good about someone, don't say anything at all. Let me tell you something, words are powerful. Words are very powerful. The Bible tells us that the tongue has the power of life and of death. It can, it can bring life to a relationship and it can kill a relationship. It can bring life to your dreams and your career. It can bring death to those things. He said, listen, put them in mind. Remind them of these things, Titus. That if they are followers of Christ, they don't need to be speaking evil of any man. Words are powerful. Hey, when you read the New Testament, the words of Christ, are those the same kind of words you use? Well, now preacher, you know, I've just got, I can't help it sometimes. It just slips out. Hey. I ain't never had anything slipped out that wasn't already in there. That's the only way it slips out. We're supposed to put a bridle on that tongue. We're supposed to stop long enough to think, okay, my words right here, are my words, a couple things, are they going to represent my Savior well? Okay, here's the second thing. Are the words I'm about to say, are they going to help the situation or harm the situation? Are they going to build this person up or tear them down? Look, sir or ma'am, when you look at your spouse and you're upset and you say, oh, you're an idiot. Now, let me ask, be honest. What was that supposed to help? Were they supposed to say, you love me? No. You can't do anything right. You're always doing this. Boy, we'll just, man, we use this tongue to beat people up. He said, that's not the follower of Christ. No doubt there are times for stern language and stern use of words. We see that Christ using that. By the way, we see him using it with the religious Pharisees. When he said, look, you're hypocrites. You're blind leaders of the blind. You're taking people to hell. That's the only time we see him really using that stern language. Well, we do see him using it with Peter once when he said, get thee behind me, Satan. That's pretty strong. Look what he says next. Speak evil of no man to be no brawlers. Goodness. Man. Come on. Paul, you expect us to act like Jesus? Be no brawlers. What does that mean? To be gentle, not fighting, not contentious. You ever met somebody that's just, they're just looking for a fight to pick. You ever met anybody like that? I mean, they're just looking for, a, for somebody to, if somebody don't jump on them in 24 hours, they're going to jump on somebody. They, they love an argument. You ever met somebody that loves an argument? <laughs> I mean, just love to find some reason to argue that their, their own go, instead of being ready to good works, they're, they're, they're ready for, okay, man, who can I cuss? Who can I argue with? Who can I insult? Who can I disagree with, man? Come on, I, I, I'm ready for a good fight. So many times we see Christians that way, people that profess to be Christians, they're just, man, their own go. I'm looking for someone to give a good tongue lashing 
to or someone to punch or something. Listen to what Romans 12, 17 says. Recompense to no man evil for evil. When they do you wrong, remember this, you're a child of God. Your response, we talked about that in Sunday school today, your response will either be a great picture of Christ or a distorted picture of Christ. Well, they cut me off in traffic. Well, that, I was standing in line. They came and jumped in front of me. Why do we think we have to speak with insults and threats or labels or whatever, whatever other type of negative destructive language? Why do we think we have to do that? It really, it, it, it's not going to get you anywhere. A lot of times we do that in an effort to manipulate somebody. That's still not getting you anywhere. Why do we feel that we have to interrupt and overtalk and shut others down? Think before you act or speak. Think this, how will this reflect on Christ? Before you show that temper, and by the way, there is a time to display that temper. There's a time to use your temper, not to lose your temper. Never a time to lose it. What, how will it reflect on Christ right before you speak that insult? Right before you air it all out on Facebook. Boy, that is really mature and intelligent, isn't it? I get in an argument, boy, I just need to express my feeling, my personal feelings, and we, we type it in and we hit sin, and then somebody uh, uh, makes a, a comment correcting us, and we're like, this is my personal business that I put on the World Wide Web. 1 Peter 2, 21 through 23, For even here to, hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Listen, refuse to retaliate. That's not the way I was taught. Well, me neither, man. Well, turn the other cheek so you, they hit you on one side. You turn the other cheek after they hit you there. The Bible doesn't say anything else. Just stomp a mud hole in them and walk it dry. Of anything, Listen. Once we follow Christ or, or place our faith in Jesus Christ and we're following him, he's our Savior. It's not about us anymore. The Bible says, what? Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? So that, that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. It goes on to, say, on to say, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. I, listen, I don't even, Ronnie Wise does not belong to Ronnie Wise. I was purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. He hung for me on the cross, took my sins on his own body. He paid that price for me. I am eternally indebted to him. So it's not about me. It's about my Savior. How many of you have ever been out somewhere with one of your children and they said something that embarrassed you? Anybody? Am I the only one? Oh, come on now. Y'all had angels, I had devils, what in the world? Man, they'll do stuff. Sometimes I, I remember my oldest son, Chad, we were out visiting a bus route there uh, outside of Charlotte where I'd pick up kids on Sundays on a bus and take them to church. And we stopped at a Chinese restaurant. And uh, uh, I, he said, Dad, why is the rice this color? I said, no, is this rice? And it was fried rice, but I called it wild rice. And I was just playing with him and said, this is wild rice. You take a bite of this, it makes you wild. And so I took a bite, and I swallowed and went, <laughs> see what it does to you. So we're in this Chinese restaurant, right? He was like, oh, man. So he took a bite, chewed it up, swallowed and went, meow. And I said, not in here. The wrong animal sounds. <laughs> 
my soul. There have been times they would say something that's, or they'd say, well, my daddy said this. Oh, Brother Borowski. Oh, he was telling us the good this morning. You know, he preached last week, right? Were you all here? I, I wasn't. Uh, no. So he was in the restroom, and Nicholas, Steve Kennedy's son, was in there. He said, hey, are you talking today? He said, no, nah, Mr. Ronnie's going to be talking today. He said, okay, my dad said you're loud. <laughs> <laughs> and his wife's back there saying, yeah, I <laughs> buy our earplugs for Christmas. Now listen, what our children do and say, you know who that reflects on? Really, it, it does reflect on us, right? What we as followers of Christ do and say, it's not just about us. It reflects on our Savior. No brawlers, not those that are always wanting to fight, always wanting to argue, not speaking evil of people. Now, let, here's the next one here. But gentle, showing all meekness to all men. That word gentle, it means this, suitable, fair, mild. According to James, gentleness is one of the characteristics of spiritual wisdom. In James 3.17 it said this, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, meekness. We often confuse meekness with weakness. If somebody's meek, they're weak. Nothing can be further from the truth. That's not an accurate definition. Both Moses and Jesus were described as meek. It's a quality that moves us to bow to the will of the Father and to the needs of others. Okay, here's what I want to do, but here's your need, okay. And I'm going to bow to your need. I'm going to defer. Here's what I want to do, but oh, Father, I was reading your word, and you have a, a different plan, a different vision. You have different goals and different desires. So you know what, God, no, I don't, no, I like what I'm doing. This is what you want. So I'm just going to do what you want, what you expect of me. You see, that's meekness. It is the forbearance of wrath and passion. Preacher, boy, they deserved a good chewing. They deserved this. Oh, boy. Meekness says, no. Nah. They may deserve it, but I'm not the judge, so I'm not giving it to them. It's the willingness to yield my rights to others the Bible speaks of, use this terminology, in honor preferring one another, putting the other person ahead of myself. Well, now I want to tell you, this stuff's kind of hard. It'd be much easier, I think, if they said, okay, if you want to be a follower of Christ, here, come to church services on, on these days, and, and here's the way you dress, and here's what you, uh, 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 the places you do and don't go. Man, that would be easy. But this is real stuff right here. You mean I, I've got to act like Christ? That's, that's what you want me to do is act like Christ? Well, that's what I'm trying to be a reflection of, right? All meekness unto all men, even to those that we think do not deserve it. Listen to this even to those who have contrasting or opposing opinions of ours. Even, now hear me, even to those of contrasting faiths, showing meekness, all meekness, unto all men. When Paul went to Mars Hill, you know the story in Acts? He went up to Mars Hill where they, they loved to talk about things and they would debate and all this about God's. He didn't go up there, folks, and, and, and rip them to pieces. He went up there with meekness and humility and said, hey, listen, I was observing all these altars that you have to all these gods, and I saw one that said, the altar to the unknown God. You feel like you left one out? Well, that's who I'm here to talk to you about today. The one and only God. 
with meekness and gentleness and humility, Paul spoke to them the words of Christ. Consider others more important than yourself. Philippians 2, 3 says this, let nothing, say those two words with me, let nothing, oh, some of you didn't say it, say it with me, let nothing, okay, so let nothing what? Let nothing be done through strife, nothing, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Listen, church, it's when Christ followers act like Christ that we rock this whole world. That's why these disciples, when they went to towns, they would say, hey, they're here. Who's here? Men that have turned the world upside down. In just a matter of years, that's what they were known as. It's not because they were dynamic men. It's that they had a dynamic message and their lives were changed in such a dynamic way by a dynamic Savior. It is when we act like Christ that we rock this whole world. Let me point out a, a, a difference between two things, a contrast here. Religion most often becomes controlling and abusive. You understand what I'm saying? That religion says, okay, here's what you do, here's what you do, here's what you don't do, don't do, this do, this do, yes, 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 no, yes, no, yes, no. Eventually that come, becomes most often controlling and abusive. But a relationship is always looking for what can be done for the other. Not what the other can do for you, but what you can do for the other. That's a relationship. That's Christ's relationship with us, and that's supposed to be our relationship with him and with each other and with the world, always looking, what can I do for the other? It is in our submission. It's seen in our readiness, our our. Our faith is seen in our submission. It is seen in our readiness to do good to and for those around us, even the ones we disagree with. That person I told you I sat down with and talked this week that confided in me about something. I said, listen, I want you to know this. You can always come to me and talk about absolutely anything. I will not think any less of you. I love you regardless, okay? That person said, thank you. I said, now... I want to know, do I have the right to be open and honest with you and you give me that same room? And he said, yes. I said, okay, because look, we don't have to see eye to eye on each thing to be each other's friends and to help each other. Is that right? That's right. It's in our submission. It's in our readiness to do good for those around us. It's in our gentleness that they see Christ. It's in our meekness that they see Christ. It's in being humble before all men. Yes, those even with opposing political views. Christians during election seasons just about get out of the bank sometimes. Now, there are things that, once again, that we are to stand firm on. But I don't see Christ... Anywhere preaching against Caesar, as a matter of fact, he said, give the things to Caesar that belong to Caesar. I I don't see Paul saying, boy, I want to tell you all something about Nero. He's a a, a dirty so-and-so. We need to overthrow that rascal. No. You know what he said? He said, pray for those that are in authority over us. Even those with errant lifestyles even those with different loyalties. It is when we act like Christ that we rock this whole world and we give the Holy Spirit room to work through us to rock this whole world, to turn this whole world upside down. That's where it is, folks. That's what it is all about following Christ. You can come here and, and sit on these pews until the cushions have broke down And the screws from that leg are sticking you where they stick you. 
you can come here and give 50% of your paycheck every we don't have nobody doing that. But get 50% of your paycheck every time we pass that plate. And let me tell you something. That's not going to rock the world. Now, if they're done in a heart of love, that's a good thing. But that's not going to rock the world. It's when we, outside these walls right here, where we spend less than 4% of our life, outside these walls, we're acting like Christ did, that Christ is able to use us to change this world. So here's my challenge to you this morning. I'm putting you in mind of these things that Paul told Titus to put the people in mind of. Will you take that challenge and be like Christ? Let's bow our head and close our eyes, please. Father, we love you, and we are in desperate need of you. Father, we have this tremendous ability to bring harm to the cause of Christ. We become so selfish, so full of pride. We become so set on our own desires, our own um, way of doing things, and resistant to you. And because of that, Father, sometimes the world, does, or the world has a, a faulty picture of Christ. Would you help us, Lord, to yield to you?